Okay, hi everyone. Uh, myself, Vabhav, I'm working with Adobe as a security researcher. Uh, so I would like to inv invite our panelist, esteemed panelist. First, I would like to invite Himanshu. Uh, Himanshu is heading a security, uh, security for a startup based out of Bangalore. Uh, he has built security team from ground up in the past and present. So he has a vast exposure of uh, how to handle security engineering from pro pro product company perspective. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Nilu. She's working as a principal consultant uh, for AppSec at ThoughtWorks India and has a background of offensive and defensive security uh, and has been actively involved in shaping security engineering practices for a variety of products and tech stacks over there. Next, I would like to invite Ankur. Uh, she's working as a head of information security at CureFit. Uh, he has been working with designing and maintaining security engineering practices for uh, a couple of Indian startups for uh, past seven years. Uh, I would also like to invite uh, Mr. Kushal. Uh, he's a public interest technologist at Freedom of Press Foundation. Uh, he's been spending his life helping various FOSS projects uh, in different communities. Uh, part of the TOR core team uh, and also a core developer of CPython and director of Python Software Foundation. So. Uh, thank you all panelists for joining us. So, okay. So let's try speaking. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 Cool. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, so basically, the idea of the panel is we have been following various security engineering practices uh, across our companies as part of software development firms, software delivery firms, product companies, consulting, and all that stuff. So what are the various complications that we deal in day in, day out while we're dealing this kind of stuff? So I have a few things in my mind to drive this panel. Uh, one of the key things that we are seeing in the current industry is that the technology is moving really, really fast. So today, yesterday, we were doing our deployments on data centers. Now we are moving towards cloud. Uh, now things are getting containerized. So the technology landscape, if you see, has been moving really, really fast. So. Uh, how, how do teams ensure, in, in your perspective, uh, and I can start with Kushal, you, uh, how do you teams ensure uh, that uh, your, your engineering task force is keeping up to the date uh, with, with the latest security threat landscape? So, um, my, our engineering team, uh, because we are a non-profit, it's a, a little bit different game altogether. Uh, we are a small team. At the same time, uh, the team was made, like, all the people coming up with different kind of background and experience. So what we try, even like today or in future also, that at least one person in the team is looking into what are the new things in particular domains. It can be a web application level, it can be like how we deploy software, it can be how we are managing our dependencies. And like uh, there is a open practice, uh, we call them like uh, more detailed calls, which are public and open where anyone can join and uh, where we discuss about one of the new things which you learn and how we are going planning to use it in future. So, and because we are a small team, our game, I think a little bit like we can still cope up easily because we don't have to teach too, too many new engineers, but that's for us. But being a small organization, being a small team, don't you feel challenged in uh, ensuring that people are also doing their engineering work also parallel to that they are also learning the security practices or do you feel it's easier to manage in a smaller team as compared to bigger teams like probably other panelists are uh, heading? Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, basically, it me also means you will not have much of life left. Otherwise, like just <laughs> like too much of security. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So Himanshu, uh, I, I believe you have worked in a couple of startups, product companies and all and you, you've been heading uh, security team uh, from past some time. So what is your experience with the the challenges around you know, uh, uh, s s uh, keeping up with a new technology stack. Right. So there are two perspectives uh, being in a startup. Uh, there is a business perspective and there is a tech perspective. Uh, from business standpoint, basically business wants to enable whatever is the requirement 
and therefore the time to business or time to move tech is very very fast right so from tech standpoint uh, the major challenge is how do we enable business how do we ensure uh, whatever is the business requirement in a very short time uh, given a very small team that we have how do we enable that so this becomes very tricky right so at times uh, decision making uh, from the security standpoint is very much critical for example if there are any sort of integration that is happening within the tech then it becomes very critical for us to review in a very short time and ensure that there is no security issues and all the security best practices are being followed right so that again becomes very tricky uh, when we have a very small team and time to business is very critical so the balance between uh, business plus keeping the tech uh, moving um, is something very much challenging for security team that uh, i have observed in last couple of years right so how do we do this uh, basically if if you see uh, in the startups and all we can't have process uh, as i told the uh, time to business is very much critical and we have to enable business how do we do that right so that becomes very much essential so process kind of can't happen instantly it's again a cultural thing for all of us right so how do we do this so we can't we can't have a checklist again right so every time that uh, a requirement from business comes in um, those are all logical requirements right so we have to see what are the risk the, what is the threat landscape so threat modeling is something that we take as a first step uh, in the whole uh, aspect of the business requirement and see from threat land uh, threat modeling perspective what we can do on the tech side right so what is the risk if you are integrating with say for example some bank right so what could be the risk uh, or what could be the threat right so if there are customers making payments through our platform then what do we need to do about all all of those right so this becomes very critical for us and uh, on the whole business requirement we do threat modeling right so once we have a threat modeling in practice or in place then we have a basic idea of what do we need to do because threat modeling will answer basic questions on uh, is there a risk on this integration right and what are the requirement what do we really need to look at, look at so all of this gets basically answered uh, uh, by threat modeling and then we take a call uh, what are the next step do we want to you know get into a checklist based model or do we want to look into the whole integration um, from a logical perspective wherein we can enable business and we can move tech faster um, being said that again uh, managed service as a, you mentioned right now ever mentioned um, the tech teams are moving to managed services right now right so for example public clouds ab aws gcp or azure uh, they have solved lots of operational problem for us right so any sort of uptime related thing sla thing is being taken care by this public clouds right so moving on to public cloud is again beneficial that we have seen uh, recently and there is again a shift in the whole tech side where people are trying to get rid of operational effort and <clears throat> the whole cost and spend thing comes into picture wherein uh, people are starting our business are starting to make a cautious call on basically how we can actually move faster by reducing the operational effort so largely uh, these are few of the key things that i have observed um, i'll let another uh, other panelist uh, to add their points sure so uh, uh, we we'll come back to this one uh, i i got i jo pointed out a few things sure. security in cloud is probably something which we'll talk about how we Absolutely. are ensuring how we are delegating risk to the public cloud vendors uh, but before that uh, on the first one neelu uh, you have been part of a consulting organization and now you are in a software delivery organization what is your perspective towards keeping up to the new tech stack that we are uh, yeah yeah so i think uh, in our case uh, scenario is quite different so there is scale uh, but there is also a variety of different tech stacks and there are different requirements that keep happening uh, here i think the way we try to look at it is to include security prominently as a part of quality because for a very long time even when there was waterfall and now a lot of teams are moving to agile uh, everybody looks up to more functional side rather than looking at the quality aspects particularly security and that's what we are trying to create the main focus so the way we try to look at it is this is this has to be in layers first of all there is no single solution to it at least for us uh, there has to be the technology side where we automate a lot of things through the ops side which we were already talking about but we are also looking at educating people creating processes so that everything one leads to another and eventually the end product that you get ensures that quality and that eventual security uh, threshold that you want to reach okay so uh, ankur thanks thanks neelu uh, 
Uh, Ankur, you have been part of uh, currently uh, working with a healthcare kind of related to a health industry organization. So, and I'm assuming security is a critical aspect towards uh, ensuring that the data is secure. So, what what is how are you keeping up to the latest trend? I'm assuming your uh, organization has been using a lot of new tech stack as well. So, uh, how how is uh, security keep uh, being kept uh, on on toes in your organization yeah so well so what i've realized is the new tech stacks will come and this this scenario will never change because today they are today we are working on some particular tech stack uh, probably after a few years we'll move on to something else but what you have, what i have personally realized is uh, in a startup like ours where uh, where there's an investor push or you have uh, you have to gain customers and you have to expand your business like anything and you can't really expand your uh, your security team like that right business will grow and teams will grow but engineering might grow but you cannot have uh, the same type of growth in your security teams and first thing i realized was that you need to have a proper structure of your thought process what you want to achieve and what you want to do in in your security team so basically according to me there were four steps which i thought i should have in my team and first one being educate right and which is really important in in uh, business critical teams product critical teams not not only tech teams because we are operations heavy business we have gyms we have uh, hospitals we have eat fit kitchens and all those things right so it, it it's not only security in tech but it it is there in product engineering plus operations business team and everywhere right so first thing according to me was cultural change in education second was automate and this is to bring you know uh, security invisible right a developer should not even see uh, is, is there something going on for security in background right so just to make things uh, you know very critical and automate things uh, second thing was automation third according to me was monitor okay so what we have done we should we should be are we finding results or or there is something wrong going on to monitor and the fourth thing is iterate all of the three steps right so according to me i have structured my vision and team such a in such a way that we have specific uh, teams working on specific buckets and that's how we make sure uh, uh, things are never changing or you know uh, that's how it interesting interesting perspective so one of the thing that i can see from uh, from all of the panelists is uh, some common factors is educating your engineering teams so uh, and because so again since we are having a discussion on complications uh, because there's multiple tech stacks multiple things now earlier we used to have aws now you're moving towards azure and then gcp and you know alibaba or whatever cloud and then containers and you know angular js and blah blah and what not so uh, do you see any challenges with uh with engineers coping up to the latest trend from the education perspective like from your perspective like what exactly would you impart or ask your uh, engineering teams would they learn cloud or cloud security or aws security or azure security or container security or you know particular language security or a framework security so there are a lot of things so what is your perspective uh, and himanshu you can take a lead and start so what that. i have seen uh, recently is basically for developers uh, since in a startup there is a flexibility of uh not following a particular framework or a technology right so they are flexible to use any language per se or any framework per se right so <clears throat> the independent that the developers are getting is basically uh, the call that developers can make today right so uh this brings a interesting problem from security standpoint wherein developers try to see like what what are the tech stack where the support is very good the documentation are good right and they go with it so the realization of whether uh, the whole framework has been reviewed from security standpoint or not is a challenge for me right now right so i i am not sure if uh, the particular te technology which developer is trying to use is uh, has been re reviewed by someone else right so the whole supply chain security and the supply chain compromises and all the all of that comes into picture right so that becomes very tricky for us to ensure that whatever developers are using or whatever technology shift that they are trying to make is secure and whatever uh, the technology platform that we are moving in uh, has the best practices so the whole supply chain security becomes very much critical for all of us that's my view on it okay uh, kushal what are your thoughts since you you're saying you you're a smaller group of uh, engineers so yeah i'm yeah. going to use a different term here upstream uh, mm -hmm. whatever technology stack we are using let's say like even say cloud like doesn't matter which company 
end of the day, uh, most of these new technology stacks coming up are actually based on some other open source tools. And they are just teaching them up in a proper way so that other businesses can consume them in a faster manner. So if you are a smaller team, you may want to have your engineers give some freedom to have look into those stacks like below, not uh, not the cloud level, but the actual operating system level and things those clouds, those containers are using. Because if you actually work with any of these technologies in the upstream level, uh, you'll already find that because there are many other companies, many people are working together, there are already some predefined uh, practices, the stories, the things you can learn, and much faster it will be for you to adopt those in your job. So I mean, that's one suggestion which really worked, like at least in my career I saw that uh, while training any new engineering team or like if you find an engineering team using new stack, asking them to, you know, to familiarize with the people behind that stack, like the kind of practices they use. Because in many cases, they are, the authors are also using the same stack in their org. So that helps a lot to learn faster for a small org. Okay, so uh, I'll move on to the uh, other point that I would bring and I think that was already brought in one of the discussions is, uh, so you talked about supply chain and securing the supply chain and uh, Nilu, I believe you, you're part of the software delivery uh, organization, so obviously you're building and developing code for other organizations, so one of the key things is you need to ensure that the customers are being delivered with a secure software, so obviously supply chain must have been a critical part of your security. So how, how do you feel about ensuring that your supply chain is secure, your third part, it could be, you know, third party dependencies, it could be your build process, it could be your, you know, uh, delivery mechanisms like CDNs and all that. So, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, supply chain security? So, uh, mainly when it comes to the dependencies, we try to automate as much as possible. Uh, because I was just relating quickly to the previous point because there are so many new languages that we are working on and it's, it's not always that. So, the learning curve is high there. Uh, there is not a lot in security that's already established, like some of the known tech stacks which are there. So those challenges are already there. And when the dependency problem comes in, not everything is in the hands of the developers. So for the known tech stacks, definitely we try to automate as much as possible so that we catch those dependency early on. And then we move on to, you know, the, the best possible version of that. Uh, but when it comes to those, the, the very new ones or uh, the very new or performant languages, particularly where, uh, say, for example, the client is saying, no, we want it because it is performant, you know, but, but they are not, uh, uh, they are okay to deal with or how we deal with the vulnerabilities in the dependencies. So in those cases, I think a kind of awareness and education on the part of the developers is important to say, hey, uh, these are some of the fundamental issues which will be there how you implement. So when you go to implement it uh, by writing code, you will have to take care of these things. So depending on that, if say for example, dependencies are not covered in that, they may have to write custom code for that. Uh, but for most of the known tech stacks which are available, they know that they can automate a lot of this, catch them early on and fix it in the journey. Okay. Ankur, uh, would you would you like to add? Uh, yeah, so being on the, on the other side of the story, because uh, I think and Himanshu would agree to that, because we probably, some startups in India, all the startups in India are very business critical, and they have to go live as soon as possible, all the new features, or is there a new idea coming up, uh, they want to go live as soon as possible. And in most of the cases, I think uh, uh, there might be cases where we don't want to develop everything in-house. Right, and we have to use software built by some other companies, or uh, or say for example analytics or or anything of that sort. Right, and and we have to use code used by or developed by some other party, and we don't know how the how the security status of their company is. Uh, the software might be status, but uh, what what happens with uh, with employees and physical security, infrastructure security, and everything? Right, so uh, that's one of the challenges, uh, and I think Imanshu would agree to that 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 we face that a lot, and we but try to make sure that uh, we get the penetration re uh, testing reports from them they their security posture is correct and and being a part of very small security teams in house we don't have that luxury to basically measure security of their products right so yeah i agree that is the biggest one of the biggest challenge we are facing right now and also for uh, like uh, again I am completely, because uh, rest of my, the panelists are giving you direct uh, feedback from what's happening in the industry. I am speaking from a different point of view where like it's a, like our product are being mostly consumed by journalists and our threat model counts nascent state actors as the primary advisories and side channel attacks like these via dependencies is one of the biggest pain point to think about every day. 
uh, because we saw that happening like all of us in industry and there that the communication between that engineering team and they're like the kind of like upstream of those dependencies is important like our most of our stack is python so at the same time we are consuming all these dependencies written by like thousands of different open source software developer we also make sure that we work closely with uh, like rest of the python ecosystem what are the new tools coming what are the new like features being added in the upstream like same with the npm or any of the project dependencies like i had chat um, like i chatted before with few other big companies without taking names and all of them have enough money to create internal teams which actually reads through the dependencies and creates a like blacklist and whitelist they don't publicly talk about it because some of those blacklisted things are from other big companies but they all men monitor and may like have that link list but don't company. you think that's a little inefficient way of working correct and one of the biggest problem all of them are repeating the same task again and again yeah. so that's where we have to like uh, you know like let's say python has a python security list where people are talking about all these issues and new things coming up but it has still has to be done and unless the rest of the like ecosystem all the companies are coming up with some sort of ideas how to share information better it will still continue but uh, dependency management is like one of the most insane like risk factor and whereas the most of the like talk to any new javascript developers like node people like how many thousands of dependencies they have in their application and do you think yeah i think it's still lucky because uh, that has been there for a while think of all the new languages that are just cropping right. up and uh, clients wanted uh, you know because they are performant for example golang so when golang, golang came That's in yeah. all of us know it's performant we want it but what about the dependency so these are some of the challenges where which are tricky to deal with and do do you think that uh, since these we obviously understand the dependency is a challenge third party vulnerability management is a challenge do you think uh without naming any tools or vendor do you think this can be automated or if we can invest in a tool or a maybe free or open source or enterprise or anything and this can be solved or do you think we again back back to square when we really need to educate our developers and train our developers and make updated processes and what not so uh, yeah. talking about vendors and all in general right so one of the challenges that uh, we have faced is um say you are following a framework in your organization and maybe a cs benchmark framework or a nist framework or any open source framework you have aligned your security right so now aligning vendors to the same standard is very much difficult if there are companies small companies who are solving a specific problem for our developers and we want to onboard them possibly uh, there are very few chances or there are very little chances that they would want to align to nist framework or cs benchmark framework with their technologies right so these are again a complication right so, and on the second point talking about developer best practices nilu has already mentioned that you know golang is coming up we don't know how many vulnerabilities are there in golang today right so now keeping up to development best practices is also a challenge for us right so the couple of beer, let's let's go back in the history like couple of year back we had checklist and all we used to work uh, i still remember that when i started my career we used to have checklist right and we used to follow the checklist now that checklist model is not going to work right things have changed and things are moving so fast if i have a checklist today and if i say it with a developer probably he may not look right he may have solved maybe accesses problem by using some framework or csr problem by using some library already right so now the checklist model is also not working right now right so there is again a whole shift in the technology and this again becomes complex for us right so how do we educate developers so this is again an open item for us and the only thing that we can do is learn from their mistakes right so say for example if there are um, any security vulnerability that a developer is making uh, we can make that as an example and probably uh, document that or you know uh, do a developer training around that and say that you know uh, this was in a very general way this was a mistake that was figured out by security team and probably you guys should figure out in rest of the code base or rest of the company where you are using similar uh, code base or similar uh, lines of uh, uh, language or uh, technology and then fix that as well right so this is how we do right now but then checklist model has moved away now it doesn't so, work for us so i i think a lot of things because in the interest of time uh, right. i'm i'm moving on to a different topic a, a lot of things uh, we are seeing boils down to you know people uh, a cultural uh, shift rather yeah i mean obviously people need to get trained people need to do certain things people need to mature their processes and all that so how how do you think about 
setting up the culture uh, because if I'm not willing, I won't really study about the new technology stack or the new security training or whatever we are doing to ensure or not following the right processes. Uh, I'm supposed to maybe report dependencies, but I'm not reporting it. Maybe because again, people problem. So how, how do you uh, feel uh, about, you know, developing a healthy and a good and a very positive culture that kind of uh, cultivates this, uh, sec these security practices? So, uh, yeah, uh, Ankur, maybe you can, so, yeah. I'll tell you a very uh, recent example. So, uh, when I joined the organization, I think uh, one and a half years back, I thought, uh, uh, because I'm the first person joining there, I let, let me start with giving a free, you know, training to all the developers there and whatever I presented in, in conferences and everything, I, I should go ahead and teach them what I've learned so far and how, how can they... Uh, improve their security posture how can they basically avoid making more mistakes and i i thought i'll, I'll give a workshop hands-on workshop and i think around one tenth of the development team turned up like which was really less right and then i thought what i mean what should i do actually to basically make them interested and how what should be the topic i should teach them first and recently very recently i uh, you know started a topic of discussion where i presented on personal security how do you basically safeguard yourself, your mobile phone, your laptops, and how to basically talk about recent frauds happening, OTP, QR code frauds. And then I think uh, there were a bunch of people within CureFit, outside CureFit, uh, some of our trainers and all those things, uh, all those people turned up. And it was a huge audience. So then I realized uh, we have to talk about uh, things which people are interested in first so that they have some sort of interest in security and then start pinching them towards uh, what else is needed. So something to bring them interested into security that we have to tell them security is everywhere, not only the uh, Java code you're writing or some other code you're writing, but it is everywhere. And then when the mindset is correct, teach them actually what you want to teach so them. We as security people also needs that training. Yes. Yeah. So just, to, <laughs> just to add what Ankur said, I'm, I'm sorry. So just to add what Ankur said, right? So what we have seen is uh, developers like to solve problems. Right, so the way we try to do is probably conduct some sort of CTF for internal hackathon wherein they get a set of security challenges at the same time they're also learning uh, best practices, right? So that is one of the way by which we can probably educate developers. So whatever Ankur said is a valid thing and that's what I have also observed in past couple of years. So uh, one of the things in this uh, which I have observed is in this very interesting. So uh, there was a time when, you know, people will pay you for training and now the, the scale has increased so much that you go and push uh, the training and people won't be taking it because of the, because there is no time. Uh, but as long as the learning is one way, uh, the other side may, may not be interested, you know. So one thing is I should, they should be able to relate to it. But one way uh, we have found that also works for us is that uh, we are trying to convert more and more devs into sec champions. So that they at the end, and we are teaching them how to find issues. So at the end of the day, when they find it themselves, obviously we also add to it for coverage and all of that. But when they themselves are finding issues and security bugs, they are way more interested to fix it. They are way more able to relate to what's happening around. And they're also fixing issues right there on the respective code rather than trying to implement it sometime later. So that has brought up the interest level a lot. That's that's pretty interesting. It's more like your security license in their team. Yeah, I'm actually actually going to add a little bit more about that personal connection because as a developer working for an IT company, most of the time we look at things as job. Like this is my job. I have to get it done, and we don't see a reason to secure ourselves enough, which is going to affect the job or the customers at the end. So like just talking, like educating them a little bit about that human connection, how if I as a developer destroy something as in my security level or my standard OPSEC, how that is going to affect the end customer. In my case, some journalist or some source must just die or their family will be thrown into a jail. Or if you are working for a big MNC and then if you forgot your laptop uh, unlocked in the bar or just dropped the USB drive with latest information, which is not supposed to be public and another bar, how that's going to affect you and some other people in your company or your clients. Just, you know, giving them that human touch between how this very small thing is going to affect, that creates a lot of change in how people look at problem, security problems. Because they always think it's security team's issue, not my issue. Cool. So in the interest of time, I would like to uh, ask essentially, uh, kind of in crux, 
what are the two security must have as per you uh, that you would advise to the security to the engineering teams to the dev teams or to the product teams uh, and uh, nilu you may take it uh, sir yeah okay uh, so i think the first point which i would like to advise is the thing that i gave myself uh, not to the dev teams to the security team because we are trying to cater to that at the end of the day as well is that understand the spirit of the audience that you have and and see what their priorities are uh, see that you can make it you can make security a priority in in the way they think so that every time they think about it whether they code whether they talk about it whether they're doing threat modeling they will always have security in mind so that gets done on its own uh, and the second thing is that uh, from the devs perspective we always tell them that look try and connect your product to the larger business the business context in which it operates so that you understand that okay if i don't do a validation here or if i don't have authorization here it can actually lead to so they can correlate back to what threats are there on the ground so until that is happening they will always think of all those things while they are coding and they will go ahead and code securely rather than otherwise uh, himanshu so one of the thing um, that i think is kind of a Uh, again a, a cultural shift or rather uh, the kind of communication that security team can do to uh, the tech teams uh, basically by establishing a, a you know decent connection or a, a working uh, a working model with the teams right so talking about the uh, whatever nilu has mentioned so uh, basically say for example let's take an instance of uh, there is a sql injection attack or uh, that has been discovered by one of the security team right so um what i have observed right now is instead of uh, you know going and blaming the developers that you have made a mistake you rather go and educate them right so education largely becomes a, a very integral part of security engineering practices wherein uh, you go and then build a relationship with them and educate them that oh, this is something that uh, has been uh, wrong, wrongly done and then these are the way you can improve it right so recommendation is what i think uh, as a practice we should do uh instead of going and pointing out mistakes and saying that hey you know there is a bug in the code you go and then tell them this is how you fix it right so recommendation becomes very critical and then you build a um, relationship with them at the end of the day right so the whole cultural shift uh, is kind of required right now in the industry when we solve problem for them and they they can continue writing code right so that is something i believe is uh, what we need to do cool Yep, uncle. I think <clears throat> Himanshu and Neil have spoken about uh, what should we do with developers and how to educate and uh, build relationships with them and uh, be comfortable with them. I think one one idea which I've tried in my organization is uh, uh, you know making sure leaders know security is important. And when CEO and uh, CEO or, or all the other leaders know about it, uh, and they talk about it on in in all the meetings, or you know, it's it's in the vision of the company. We are a healthcare company, right? And if you if you don't talk about security being part of the company uh, to the customers or within the organization, uh, it will not help. So first thing I made sure was in every presentation in vision or or long term vision or product ideas and everything, we make sure that there is a part of security mentioned, so that whenever that vision is delivered under the company and uh, the security is always part of uh, all the meetings so that's how i think developers would be the last person who would uh, security be reached out to after a vision is set so it it comes down automatically that's an interesting point yeah, yeah. i'll tell a complete because whatever i had in mind is already covered so <laughs> i'm going to give you a different example ask your teams doesn't matter developer management sales to read more non fiction books about what's happening in the industry in the world you uh, may should paraphrase non fiction <laughs> yeah I, uh, yeah so i'll give you like a little bit examples like being an indian kid uh, we watched enough hollywood movies also and many things we, which we watched before only in james bond movies are actually happening every day we may not know about it there might be some people in the crowd who know about it but your teams should also know that these are not sci fi movies or these are not problems only in spy movies they are happening to everyday developer everyday normal people your parents our parents all of us uh, just to give you one simple example all of you after going back from here if you can search in duckduckgo i hunt sys admins i hunt sys admins pdf or document search about it it's one of the edward snowden leak document where it talks about one nsa employee 
who goes to all these conferences, sit among us, try to find out who are the sysadmins in different companies and steal their information while in the conference. It, and it's not, we know about one country, but it's true for almost each and every country. There are people whose day job is that. So, you know, we have to train this and understand that it's happening with us. So, like, I think that's going to help and scare many people also at the same time. Interesting, interesting. So, cool. Uh, I think we have some interesting points from this discussion. I've kind of jot down a few. Uh, so, I, I'll just reiterate some key points that we have talked about in this. Uh, assessing the business risk, threat modeling at scale, uh, leaders should be on board, education is the key, uh, and obviously you should have appropriate processes, automation, uh, the better you automate the good, uh, unify technology, uh, your recommendations should be uh, in line with what the team is would like, can understand or comprehend, uh, build culture, have security liaisons, security champions, build relationships with the product teams, uh, human connection, empathy towards development, developers, and uh, leaders should be on board and leaders should obviously read about security to understand the whole security culture. So uh, I think we kind of sum up well at this. Uh, we have some uh, good takeaways and uh, I believe we have some time for questions. Do we? Yeah, I think we have. Yeah, this is Veda from RL. <coughs> so from a traditional monolithic application to microservice application, we are talking about web application to a device, mo mobile and mobility and other stuff. So where the APIs and Docker, containerize, there's a lot of changes happening and already you have covered some of stuff. Where from a SDLC to Agile, when you go for, so you need to take care of security is very important. I, I think we are not <coughs> able to hear Sorry. you. Again, let me repeat again. So from a monolithic application to a microservice application, can you hear me well? Just uh, keep it a little far. Okay, uh, if you can keep it a little far, Slide maybe far. that would be a little. I think we speak again. Yeah. Maybe you can hear Yep. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. See, now there's a lot of change in the digital transformation technology, right? From a monolithic application to microservice application, right? So everything like right from a, a building an application as a one instance to a microservice way, like a dockerize and containerize deployed in this one. So there's a lot of changes happening from SDLs to Agile. So now I, I think you have covered some of the stuff on the security, what you have to do. But can you just give me a, now how do you go about approaching security Right for a microservice application. So basically, just to reiterate the question, uh, so your question essentially is how to uh, assess security in the microservices architecture. Earlier we used to have monolithic application. Now we're moving towards microservices and all. How how we assess security and microservices? And any of our panelists can take, unless you have specific panelists you would like to take this question. Yeah. yeah so uh, very quickly. Uh, Basically, microservice with microservices, uh, you have to start at the architecture level uh, because you will see initially when it was monolith, it used to be a single component uh, and your entry exit points were more or less fixed. Now, a lot of that is changing. Components are changing. There are a lot of third party uh, APIs that you're connecting with, vendors you're connecting with, data stores you're connecting with. So, you have to start at least at, if not at the, so we always say start at the security requirements right from the requirement stage. But if even if not there, you have to start from the architecture uh, level and see, uh, maybe do a threat modeling and, you know, or multiple threat modeling, understand what risks and sets there are, what kind of integration points you have, and then get into the code side of security and then maybe, you know, look at uh, what is the behavior side of things, how is the application responding, are these services, what is the authentication side of these, are these, you know, services authenticating to each other or not, how is the user authentication happening. So I think a lot of these things are fundamental to any kind of uh, microservices environment. Anybody else? Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Neelu. Yeah, I think we have another question. Uh, so uh, yeah. we can take one by one. Yeah. 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 Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? My name is Fani Kishore. I'm from Genpack. Um, so you talked about various technical challenges or technical, you know, issues that you deal with. Uh, but how do you enforce security as a 
primary objective for development teams to follow because what I have seen, though they know the security of the applications, many times they won't follow it properly or, you know, they, they, uh, I, they end up with exceptions. They end up with asking for exceptions. So how do you enforce like security as a, you know, primary uh, objective in your, uh, wherever you worked? Right. So, uh, just to reiterate the question, uh, uh, just to summarize on a very high level, the question is how do we enforce security, right? Um, so, as a primary objective, right? So, my take basically, uh, maybe you guys can add more, but security at the end of the day can't be enforced. It can be enrolled, right? So, you don't start with enforcing security at first. Let's take an example, right? So, for example, talking about microservice architecture. Um, let's say our team builds an automation to review or, uh, you know, do a security review of my microservice architecture. Now, uh, if you have to roll out the whole automation in the company, you can't enforce it, right? Maybe you can work with two, three teams, enroll it, enroll those teams, and then see the adoption, understand, get the feedback. And once the enrollment has been done, at later point of time, you can see how you can enforce that, right? So now enforcement would not be a security team decision, right? Tech has to be aligned. You have to onboard several teams. Uh, maybe there is a product team on whom uh, basically you want this tool to be adapted, right? There will be release team within your company, right? With whom you may want to keep this automation as a part of one of the release checklist, right? So enrollment is the first step and then probably you can see gradually mature the whole framework and then enforce. Same applies for whatever exercise or best practices that you are trying to do uh, within your company. Uh, you guys want to add something? Cool. Uh, I think we're short on time. So we can have one more question. I think there was one on back if you want. No? I, okay. Oh, there's one more question. So, uh, over here. Uh, yeah, over here. In the front. Oh, yeah, you have? Okay. I just wanted to add to the answer for that monolithic uh, question. I mean, you are coming to microservices. How do you secure? So just to add more meat to that answer, uh, although you are going to microservices, there are three la layers normally that you do. So first layer is you, what you spoke about was application security. So you have to look into authentication, how the application is built and stuff like that. Second thing that you do is you secure uh, the cluster basically where you're hosting your microservices, right? And then uh, the question was, how do you secure uh, you microservices? Know, microservices. So uh, I just wanted to add more to it that you secure the application, uh, which uh, you pointed out authentication and stuff. You secure the cluster and you secure the nodes. That is normally the three method approach that you use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was not a question. It was more like an input. So thanks. Thanks for your input. Uh, there was one more question. Last yeah. Question. Last question over here. Yeah. Oh, yep. And then probably I think we all are, uh, the panelists uh, are over there. So, yep. Uh, as he mentioned, like, uh, like, uh, we, like, uh, as a security team, we are giving like a lot of trainings for development teams. Still, they are not able to like, uh, showing interest. So, like, in that case, because one of the reason what they are telling is like, we have a lot of pressure for delivering this particular product. We have a release this week. So we cannot take, uh, take up this kind of, uh, like security. It will take more time and all. So in this situation, how, like, in your organizations, you guys are dealing? Yeah, please. Okay. So I think, uh, that's a very good exercise, which we did, we did in the last company where me and Imansu used to work together. And we did not do training, but we organized a CTF and it's like a open book exam, you can say. And, you know, that's what Imanshu said, developers like to solve problems. And that was sort of a problem given to them with a good monetary budget. And the first team wins a good amount of prize or something. And uh, we did a gamification of it. So you have to solve level by level. And when you're solving a level and we are basically trying to make them hack things and they have to study about it and solve the level. Right. And I think in terms of training, uh, uh, we, we were able to achieve very good results with this approach. And I think more than half of our engineering team uh, actually played and, uh, and, and, you know, completed the event. So that was a huge success till date I've achieved in, in terms of, you know, educating something to the developers. Cool. Okay. okay yeah. Thank you. Actually, my question was like during the like pressure, delivery pressure. So how, uh, like being a management team, how you guys are dealing with them? Because that time the delivery is important or security is important. 
so uh, i think when even when he was asking so maybe security will never be the primary objective is what because function the business is at the end of the day the primary objective uh, and everything that helps the business achieve it uh, so in this regard you have to actually work on all three different components parallelly so there has to be the people side of it there has to be the process side, side of it in the technology side of it so the first and the most problematic is the people side of it that is where you are saying that it's difficult to actually inspire them but that can only happen by actually building relationships and this is something we learn time and again time and again that we have to build those relationships we have to understand their challenges as a security team and also work with them to solve those challenges and and once they understand what's wrong they will not take much time because most of them are really smart it's just that they're not looking in that direction so once that happens you should have the right process and technology in place so that it provides the right nudge for them as soon as they get to get into a problem maybe have it in the wall so what we do is once we have threats identified we have it on the wall and daily they have stand ups so they will never ignore that because it's on the wall and every day they keep seeing it you know have it in a system like for example something like jira or project management systems that you're having so that it becomes official it's no more unofficial to deal with security box interesting thank you thank you cool so i think that was it uh, i i believe all of our panelists are available uh, around the tea coffee area so if you have any further questions that we couldn't take up because of lack of time i i think we should be able to uh, help around the uh, the open area so thanks thanks a lot thank you everyone for joining and thanks thanks for hearing us thank you